Last week, I was Rachel. Yesterday, I was Rachel. But today, I'm Astrid. I'm 24 years old and I'm a victim of brainwashing. It's weird. With the cocktail of medication that I take every day, I feel numb. I've clawed at my door and there are marks on the wall where I've smashed my head into the tiles. I don't feel it or remember it, but I do see the clumsy stitches across my temple and my blackened eyes, split lips and band-aids when I'm cleaning my teeth. According to Dr. Chase, I'm one of the worst cases inside this facility. I didn't know until yesterday that this place had Wi-Fi. Harvey leaned over in his chair during quiet time and scribbled it on his whiteboard. He's the only one allowed with a whiteboard. Unlike me who chooses not to speak, he physically can't. If he does, bad things happen. Harvey's been using the internet to play League of Legends. He's tried to describe the lore through scribbles and bad drawings, but I still don't understand it. I have my own personal laptop to write down my thoughts, though I thought the internet was completely blocked. There's an outdated web browser, but it works. Harvey playing games is surprising, but it's healthier than what he's usually doing. I've been encouraged to tell my experience on paper because I refuse to talk. And between you and me though, it's not that I'm mute like the barrage of doctors here have concluded. I just don't want to talk. I don't even know what to say. How do I talk to these professionals pretending to care? They're not subtle about being more interested in the brainwashing itself than my mental state. They prod and poke me with cocked heads and wide, fascinated eyes like I'm a newly discovered pathogen. I'm surprised they haven't dissected me. Now, Astrid, we just want to help you. They crone, prickly fingers lingering a little too long on the back of my head. They want to shave my head again for more tests, but I've grown it to my shoulders and I'm not staying long enough here for them to shave my head again. I won't let them. We just want to take samples, they say, which is a huge contradiction of their own words. Last week, we were told that we could go home, but like I said, that's not looking likely. I blame it on the boys who can't get a hold of themselves. They use whiteboards for weapons and markers as makeshift knives. I admit that our collective mental state isn't the best, but I feel well at myself. I can't remember a lot about myself. I had to be told my name and I don't know if I have family out there. There are splinters, like jigsaw pieces coming together. I have a sister, though I can't remember her face. I can finally think straight, and I've stopped trying to poke my eyes out. And nights are a lot better these days when I'm taking my medication. Days have color and I'm getting better with being separated from the others. It's still hard being away from them, but I just count the days, minutes, hours, and seconds. 22 hours, 4 minutes, 53 seconds. Every minute the clock ticks down on my head, counting down to when I can see my friends. Dr. Chase told us in group therapy that we're a unique set of patients. I don't think he knows what to call us. Officially, this facility is supposed to heal neurological trauma and brainwashing. But according to several private conversations that I've overheard, the four of us are the first actual victims of brainwashing. I'm not talking drug-induced hypnosis or mental torture, or in some way I am. We're the real deal, which means that I guess we're valuable. What scares me is these people whose lives are revolved around this specific technology have no idea what it is or where it came from. Oh, we care about you, Astrid. They tell me with soothing patient tones that you call me down. Yeah, BS. They want what was inside of me. Dr. Chase doesn't just want to cure me. He comes into my room in the night hours and just stands in the doorway scratching his head. And then he brings in others, dark silhouettes looming over me when they think that I'm sleeping. They all dress the same, disheveled looking and kind of gorky. They all say the same thing. I've never seen anything like this before, which is concerning. They have theories, of course, but I don't think they even believe their own hypothesis. During lunchtime, I see them slip into Nicholas's room. 
He's considered a band red, and so I'm not surprised that he's the mind that they fawn over. Screw Nicholas. I wish that he would come back to Earth. I thought that he was okay, and then in the middle of group therapy, the idiot attacks a nurse. I was dragged away before I could really see anything, but all I had to see was the glistening red puddle on the floor. The sharp scarlet smear is staining the cuffs of his clinical white pants for me to know that he in no fact was okay. He just kept going. God, he wouldn't stop, slamming the corner, the corner of his whiteboard into the orderly skull. The sharp split of plastic made a surprisingly good blade. I was already being dragged, but I couldn't stop staring. The orderly wasn't moving anymore, and what was left of his head was splattered all over the floor. It reminded me of a coconut that had been cracked open. When Nicholas raised the whiteboard again, his expression completely blank. I could still see where he had drawn a sad face in response to the question, How are you guys feeling today? Nicholas had been feeling frowny faced for a while, despite showing little to no emotion. I think his mental state is keeping us all here, and while I despise him for prolonging our seemingly endless stay here, that doesn't stop our nightly chats. I won't fully go into why I have to talk to him, and if I don't, I'll fall apart, but I'll get into that. I like being bound to someone, something poisonous, but I can't get him out of my head. I wouldn't say that we talk exactly. Lights out, I climb into bed and knock three times on my wall. We have our own code. Technically, none of us are allowed to talk directly to each other outside of therapy. Dr. Chase said that communication could be detrimental to our healing. Like I said though, it's impossible not to talk to them. So, we talk in our own way. Harvey and I talk through whiteboards and Addie actually speaks. Rarely because when she does start talking, Addie can't stop, her words tangling and turning into gibberish. Her eyes roll back and she starts trembling, blood seeping from her nose. Dr. Chase explained that it's a reaction to what they can't get out of her. He describes them as splinters too small to retrieve. When Addie does speak, she talks about the world that we're told to forget. She talks about a life that wasn't real. Addie's had four different surgeries and they still can't get them out. They are the resin behind her slurring words and noticeable twitch. A sudden jerk of her head. Uh, the idea of tiny pieces of something just stuck in the meat of my brain makes me shudder. Nicholas and I, unlike Addie and Harvey, we use the good old fashioned way. One knock on my wall is, I can't talk tonight. Two is, do you want to talk? And three, my most commonly used. You're an idiot. Me doesn't reply anymore, instead he just screams. Nicholas used to reply. And before the test began and the world slowly started to feel real again, we talked endlessly all night through knocks with our own patterns and I was so in love. The type of love that felt endless. How can I describe love that I can't even remember? How can I describe feelings that were implanted and not organic? It doesn't come like a soft wave, like a first love. This was forceful, a parasite leeching into my skull. Words that weren't mine twisting on my lips. I remember being apart from him, from them, felt like a physical chain wrapped around me. A suffocating wave dragging me into the dark. But now it's different, however. With the medication and the testing and then being forcefully isolated from each other. I am Astrid and Nicholas is a stranger. I am Astrid and Nicholas is the Psycho in Room T-101. I miss the earlier days. Neither of us were on Earth at that point, and the world was like one big carousel ride that I couldn't get off of. He was always by my side, escaping his own room and slamming his hands into my door, screaming at the guards, dragging me away. It was fun. Like we were on an adventure and the only bad people were the figures in white, pricking our necks with sedatives and trying to pull us apart. We've already escaped once, all of us. Back when I called him by a different name. Back when that name was reality and everything else was a dream. Dr. Chase told me sternly that that wasn't Nicholas. 
and he was trying to make the real Nicholas better. Now I should probably tell you why I'm writing this. What got me shoved in here in the first place? I knew Craigslist didn't have a great track record, but I was taking a chance on a roam. I don't remember much about my living situation, but I know that I wanted out, so I was taking risks. It was a fairly innocent ad that caught my eye when I was browsing through the homepage. A modern college house in the middle of the city. Free internet and a single roommate who worked nights. The room itself was kind of mediocre. Yellow wallpaper, cream carpet, and some creepy painting stuck to the wall. But there was a great view of the college town, and I had enough space to make it my own. It was perfect. I applied while on the bus to class, adding that I was an independent person and it wouldn't get in the way. Dr. Chase wants me to describe my memories as detailed as I can. I remember the fall leaves dancing across the window and glued to my shoes. There was a dusting of frost on the sidewalk outside and the air smelled of rain. Class went by in a blur. The girl sitting next to me smelled like pumpkin spiced latte so I went to get my own. I got a reply when the frazzled looking barista handed me my drink. Hey, thanks for inquiring about the room. Do you want to come check it out? The owner sent me the address and I ended up standing in front of a large red door but I wasn't alone. I noticed that I was being followed halfway down the block. I crossed the road and then so did the figure. When I twisted around, a college guy around my age was staring down at the leaves that he was kicking through nodding his head to music corked in his ears. It was the trench coat that threw me off guard. I couldn't see a face, only a shock of reddish curls catching the late afternoon sunlight. And when it became clear that we were heading in the same direction, he lifted his head, eyes narrowing like this was some kind of game and I was in the lead. And then he was quickening his steps. I started power walking both to get away from him, a stray thought pushing its way into my mind. I needed to get there first. Clearly he was also thinking about it, his expression hardening with concentration. When he was at my side and the two of us were shooting panicked glances at each other, I walked faster and he followed. And by the time that we were shoving past each other through the gate, Trampling in a growing pile of leaves and practically sprinting to the door, I realized that I was unknowingly fighting for the room. The guy whose face was now visible, narrow features and wide brown eyes finally turned to me slightly out of breath. The guy was cute, a mop of reddish curls and freckles. His clothes screamed English major. It wasn't my type of cute. I preferred the manly types and this guy was kind of scrawny. Nerd cute is what I would have called him. He had slammed his hand on the door first, so I guess he had won. Still, though, I was standing like an idiot, half hoping that he would offer rock, paper, scissors. There was a prick of awkward silence before he slowly lowered his hand from the door and then knocked. He seemed nervous suddenly, his hands delving into his pockets and then picking at his shirt. You're here for the room. He said it more like a statement, avoiding eye contact and bouncing up and down on his heels. This guy smelled like old books, sandalwood and freshly brewed coffee, the embodiment of fall itself. I am, I said, and when his lip curled in distaste, I remembered that we were rivals. I'm Astrid, I said. He nodded slowly, withholding his own. Cool. I tried to smile, though my patience was running thin. Uh, do you want me to go or... He was supposed to say, no, no, we can figure this out, like a normal person. But this guy just shrugged. If you want, he side-eyed me. The room is mine because, you know, I got here first. I didn't realize how much I wanted the room until he was trying to take it from me. And when I applied for it, I didn't see any views. I found myself saying through gritted teeth. So technically I saw it first if we're using your logic. He didn't look at me. Congratulations. I nodded. Exactly, so it's as much as my room as yours. The guy's head jerked like I had personally insulted him. I inquired this morning, he said, his smile too wide. Too many teeth. I scan the app every day. 
This is the best room I've seen by far and it's overlooking the town. Well, so do I, I snapped back. I read through it on my phone. Well, good for you, he rolled his eyes, corking his earphones back in. Feel free to hang around, the boy deadpanned. But I wouldn't recommend it. I felt it then, a sudden irresistible urge to get the last word. Fine, I said my cheeks burning. He knocked again, folding his arms. Cool. Cool, I said, my voice going higher in pitch. His lip curled into a smirk. I didn't realize that I had a parrot on my shoulder. Another painful silence with me trying to think of a comeback which wasn't childish. Catching his glances and the curve of his lips forming a smirk. He knew that I was struggling. Before either of us could surrender, the door flew open and a bright-eyed girl poking her head through the gap. She looked younger than the two of us, maybe her first or second year of college. She was a blur of blonde curls and wide smiles, a feverish energy almost knocking me off my feet. The warm golden light swimming around her was homely. The guy must have thought the same, his eyes momentarily entranced by the light. I saw his shoulders relax slightly, his expression loosening, but he still made a point of keeping his distance from me, like he was already a housemate and I was a stray cat. Hi. The girl's gaze snapped to each of us, her smile growing wider. She reached out to shake my hand. Her fingers were so cold. You're Astrid, right? The girl who wants the room. I nodded, feeling smug, before she reached out to shake the guy's hand though he high-fived her instead. Harvey, you're here for the room too. For a moment, her eyes seemed to light up. Oh, the girl laughed. She spoke straight expletives. Her energy was cute, but it was a two in my face. Wait, are you guys, like, uh, inquiring together? She steepled her fingers together like she was implying something else, and we shared a mutual look of what the heck before he laughed. Not just laugh, I'm talking spluttering, almost keeling over her. No, I snapped, at the same time as the guy deadpanned. You're kidding, right? No, dude, I have standards. Ouch. That one was going to sting. The owner laughed like he was a comedic genius. Oh, well, that's nice to meet you guys. Why don't you two come in? I'm just making iced tea. She ushered us in, Harvey stepping forward first kicking off his shoes and I followed hesitantly. The house was exactly what I wanted. I walked straight into a rustic paintwork and a ratty welcome mat with the H missing from the home sweet home, cute and endearing. Further down the hall, the place oozed warmth. The lounge was small but homely, bean bags in the place of a couch. The owner danced into the kitchen and Harvey followed. I noticed that he was drinking everything, and I mean everything, in. He picked up a ceramic pig from a small table, frowning at it, and then a wooden horse. Clearly, he was yet to learn some basic human decency at the grand age of 20-something. Oh, we're in the kitchen, the owner trilled, when I found myself intrigued by Harvey, full body scanning everything in his vicinity. The guy almost dropped the pig, his eyes widening. Harvey met my gaze. We, he mouthed. I don't know what was wrong with me. Maybe there was something in the air, but the second that Harvey straightened up, I was already power walking toward the kitchen. He was right behind me, his socks sliding on the marble flooring in a rush to reach the room before me. I won this time, just. With Harvey breathing down my neck trying to shove his way through, he had the energy of an older brother. Once I was in the threshold, however, my momentary glee at winning this silent battle with a stranger dissipated. There were two others sitting around a table, cocked heads and polite smiles that were definitely not expecting us. A ponytailed brunette caught my eye, her lip curled. She was pretty. The kind of pretty that I was not used to. The pretty that caught my breath and made my chest ache. This girl was glowing, dressed in the designer fall fashion a striped scarf wrapped around her neck. Sitting across from her was a mop of blonde curls peering at the two of us like we were aliens stepping from a mothership. Previously, it looked like he had been falling asleep, a fist resting on his chin. Still, though, he raised his hand in a shy wave, 
a small crease of a smile at his lips. The ponytail wasn't as welcoming. Her cat-like eyes raked me up and down head to toe. Another one. Clearly neither of us knew that we were there for the same room. The owner who was clattering around making drinks gestured us to sit down. I did, sliding into a seat. I had no idea why I was still there. There was one room and four of us and I wasn't planning on losing my dignity for a cheap room in the city. I made my decision to announce that I was leaving. But before I could, a glass was set in front of me. Iced tea. It looked homemade, condensation fogging up the glass. Slowly lowering myself back into my chair, I took an experimental sip. Lemons with a tinge of ginger, maybe some vodka. It tasted good, a refreshing flush down my throat. I'm Tala, by the way. The owner leaned against the counter comfortably, her hands cursing her own drink. She nodded to the other two. Addie and Zach were just telling me their majors. Harvey made a point of reluctantly dropping into his chair. He downed his drink in one gulp. English language arts, he announced, hiding a burp behind his hand. Not to be that guy, but who's getting this room? He nodded at Tella, who turned and grabbed cookies from a cupboard. Yeah, there are four of us in one room, he said, which, by the way, is the cheapest that I've ever seen. So, Harvey leaned forward. Why invite all of us? He was right, but he didn't have to be a dick about it. Tella didn't speak for a moment, flashing us a grin. Do you guys like sitcoms? The question took me off guard. I thought she said, do you guys like CD-ROMs? But then Ponyteller Addie was nodding delicately sipping from her glass. Yeah, they're alright I guess, I've seen all the classics, they're good. They're not funny. I noticed Harvey's grip slip around the rim of his glass before he tightened his hold. The jokes are painful and the humor tries way too. I jumped when a shattering sound hit my ears, drowning out the rest of Harvey's rant. Tella had dropped her glass but she didn't move her hand still in midair, fingers cinched, like she was still holding it. How much? She spoke softly, her lips curving into a small smile. I noticed that she was barefoot in the crunch of her stepping into shards of glass, swaying back and forth. How much what? The blonde, Zack, finally spoke up. He too looked like he was ready to leave. Zack tipped sideways in his chair before I realized that he was reaching for his backpack. Tella didn't look at us. Her feet were bleeding, but her smile was stretching wide across her lips. There was something in her eyes that I couldn't understand. She couldn't feel the pane of glass slicing into her flesh. Iced tea crept back up my throat in a sour paste. How much? She spaced out her words. Do you guys like sitcoms? Her emphasis on the word was like an explosion, mania and excitement collapsing into one, and my body began to catch up with my brain. I think that was the moment the four of us collectively realized through panicked looks that Tello was that type of person. I was the first to remember how to move. I've changed my mind. I said in a breath which tangled on my tongue. What came out instead was, I've changed my mind. I jumped up and reached the door, but my head swam, the world jolting. It looked like what electroshocks feel like, the kitchen tiles and ceiling bleeding into one. I blinked rapidly. No, I was still sitting down. I hadn't moved an inch from the chair. I don't know how to describe this experience. Dr. Chase had to sedate me the first time that I recalled it because apparently I tried to hurt myself. He told me that it was my brain's response to recalling a bad memory. When I try to say it out loud, I get jittery, and I start jamming my teeth into my tongue. With the meds, all of my fear is stripped away. I can dig into the recesses of my own trauma and see it as something brighter. Cognitive behavioral therapy. Or at least that's what Dr. Chase had likened it to. It has helped me turn what used to be a memory that put me in the quiet room for weeks, trying and failing to crack my own skull open, into a movie in my head. 
We were just getting high and Dr. Chase and the other doctors told me, sitting me down on crinkly paper on a bed and peering into my eyes with weird glasses. They told me to close my eyes and go over the memory again, and this time I had to replace Zach screaming with laughing. Tell it didn't spike our drinks with mind rotting hallucinogens and sedatives. She only gave us weed. God, Harvey's voice sounded like he was in a tunnel, a tangled moan rolling off his tongue. I was half aware of Zach on his hands and knees laughing. What did you put in those drinks? Yeah, what did you put in this? Harvey dragged out the S until something at the table with a thunk. His glass followed by his head. I remember trying to ask if he was okay before my lips were numb, my vision blurring into one singular pinprick, light slowly bleeding away. There wasn't enough time for darkness. Thunk went my head, dropping onto the table. Another thunk and a crash. Addie. I heard her head slam into the kitchen tiles. Her body. God, I can't write this. Her body landed in the shattered glass that I could hear Tella crunching through. So dark. I was nothing for a while and there was nothing. Not like dreaming or sleeping or just being knocked out, but it was deeper, more permanent. It felt like a choking, suffocating oblivion swallowing me up before choking me back out. When I cracked one eye open, it was light, too bright. I was standing, my body more of a puppet on strings. My clothes felt itchy and wrong and old, like I had been wearing them for weeks or months. There was something in my head writhing in my ears. Laughter. I couldn't move my body, my expression, my lips or eyes. I was paralyzed. The world going on around me. Initially, it looked like I had woken up in a cozy lounge. There was a couch behind me, a colorful rug and warm rustic wallpaper. But then I was looking past all of that, at scary silver walls of metal that went on for seemingly forever. I wasn't inside an apartment. I was on a stage. Disoriented, it took me a moment to register a figure standing in front of me. I noticed disheveled clothes first, crumpled jeans and a shirt glued to a skeletal figure, but I didn't know his face. He was younger, maybe by a year or two. Whoever he was, this guy had been here longer. He was the shell of a human being. Pathetic remains of what had been someone or something. Brown hair fell and wide eyes glued to me. Lips parted like he was talking. I waited for him to scream to cry out for help. But his eyes told me one thing. Play along. Part of me wanted to refuse. But then something wet and fleshy hit the ground in front of us. The world jolting once more. My vision started to clear and something slammed into me. A wave of ice water stealing my breath. There wasn't paint on the walls, it was too bright, too new and then old. Scarlet streaks blurring together. The carpet under my bare feet was suddenly slimy and wet, pooling red as seeping through my toes. Through tunnel vision, a man had been standing in front of me. With a clearer head, however, I was seeing flaws that my mind had skimmed past. Dark shadows under his eyes, yellowing bruises blossoming across his cheeks. A split lip, a thin trail of dried scarlet pulling down his temple. I think my brain was trying to shield what was in the corners of the room. Bodies piled on top of each other, some of them old, piles of bones and some of them fresh. Still warm too. The couch behind the guy was filled with three figures. I recognized them. Zack, Addie, and Harvey. Neither of them moved, their heads bowed. I jumped, or at least I internally jumped, when the man standing in front of me took my hands. Wet. His fingers were slick red and I tried to pull away, but I couldn't. He opened his mouth, squeezing out of my fingers. I didn't think there was a relationship to mess up. His voice was surprisingly calm, his expression twisting. It hit me that we were in the middle of an argument in the middle of an argument that I didn't remember, 
but my tongue was already entangled. I backed away from him as if my strings were being tugged, my lips curling into a scowl. I thought we were broken up. <laughs> Laughter followed again, a sharp thunderclap in my skull, pain that I had never felt before. That was raw and acute, struck the end of my head. I couldn't move my hands to signal that I needed help. My brain felt like it was igniting and burning. He was like me, he couldn't move and yet somehow he was squeezing my fingers hard enough to send a message. Play along. And I did, my lips moving without me words that weren't mine. An expression that wasn't mine. I was the backseat passenger inside my own body. We said we weren't going to see other people. Immediately, he was following along, a natural. Somehow. Well, how was I supposed to know? I'm not a psychic. If I was, I'd be like ten billion dollars richer. <laughs> he paused, more laughter. I mean, we would be a uh, ten million dollars richer. The words were pushing through my mouth, a forceful. Don't you think you can sweet talk me with ten million dollars? Billion, he corrected, his lips curling into a smirk. What? I can't help being smart. I hit him with the newspaper suddenly in my hand. <laughs> you smart. A snort from the couch. Harvey. Just please, he paused. Be kind to the furniture when you're fighting. His voice choked up, laughter following. It's innocent, I tell ya. Innocent. The laughter didn't stop. Louder, rooted inside my skull. My words tasted like blood. I could feel it seeping down my nose and chin. There were bugs crawling in my head. I could feel them. Sensed them sinking their tiny claws into the meat of my brain. Pouring from my ears and sticking to my neck. Their chitter, both inside my head and in the room, writhing on the walls, feasting on fleshy remains. They sunk into my thoughts, once again turning them into cotton candy, plunging me into uncertain oblivion. I spat blood through words that suddenly did not make sense. My legs buckled. The conversation went on, while I was being violently pulled back inside my mind. Rachel... The electric pinpricks in my head played with my thoughts. No, I fought back. Astrid. Consciousness came in waves. Sometimes I was standing with the nameless man and others. I was with Zach or Harvey and Daddy. After a while of suffocating on nothing, I used these momentary bursts of clarity to be thankful for those around me. My hair grew long, almost to my knees, until Tella had cut it all off scrubbing the blood off my face and making me all better. I can't remember when we lost Zack. One minute, the two of us were talking and the next, I could see them, tiny skittering bugs pouring from his eyes and mouth, his body coming apart in front of me. I didn't react when a chunk of him hit me in the cheek. I couldn't react. I hadn't spoken my own words in months, and when I tried to, my tongue was seized from me. When Tella cleaned away Zack and spread the rest of him over the walls for the feast, I started calling myself a different name. I was Rachel. The bugs eating me from the inside told me that I was called Rachel. If I fought back, they made me wish that I was dead. They made me slam my head into the ground trying to cave my own skull in. I remember there was a moment of coherency after we had lost Zack and before we gave in to our new lives. It was rare for all of us to be awake at the same time. Sometimes the bugs inside our brains went to sleep, leaving us conscious and aware for hours at a time. And keeping the facade became progressively harder when Addie found the exit door by accident. She said that we were in a bunker locked with a biometric scanner. Harvey found a weapon, a lead pipe, and we timed it perfectly. Tella went to get food for exactly 45 minutes every single day. So Harvey planned to bash her brains in. He hypothesized that she was controlling the bugs somehow, and without Tella, there would be no bugs. And I wish he was right, because then we would have only spent a year in captivity. What Harvey wasn't planning on was these things having sentience. 
They wanted the act to continue, and even with Tella gone for a moment, they wanted to be entertained. And so they entertained themselves. That was the day that we lost Harvey, too. He didn't splatter in my face like Zack, a warm, wet streak on my cheeks. Instead of attacking Tella, he slammed the pipe into his own head, again and again until he was dropping to his knees, blood pouring from his nose and begging for mercy. And Tella did give us mercy. She dropped us from thinking for a while, and slowly my name started to fade away. Rachel. I snapped away a halfway through a conversation. Zack's body had toppled onto its side, still leaning against the wall, a casual viewer. Harvey had facial hair, his hair had grown out. There was a smile stretched across his lips. Harvey called me Rachel, so I called him the name skittering in my mind, trying to break from my lips. Danny. I refused to surrender until that moment, because calling him it felt natural and I knew all of them. After all, he was my friend. More darkness and I stopped thinking again. All I could sense was the sharp chitter in my skull. Light. Addie and I were sitting on the couch watching TV. She had a bowl of popcorn and I could see Zack in the corner of my vision. Maggots had gotten into his eyes. Addie's gaze was on the TV screen that wasn't on. Her name was Elodie. She handed me a chip, her words light and whimsical, almost like we were dreaming. Chip? She offered me another with raucous laughter rattling my head. I got a boyfriend soon after. The man who I was always talking to was sleeping with. My arms wrapped around him. Even as a backseat passenger, I still felt like my heart was fluttering, my chest aching. He felt natural next to me and over the years of blinking back awake, the two of us stopped fighting it. His eyes had almost become animated over the years. He was always smiling, laughing, blood spilling from his lips that became normal. I had friends and a boyfriend living in a huge apartment. A group of 20-somethings living together as a group. As friends. What more could I ask for? And days passed after that. Weeks, months, and years. Light flooded inside the bunker when we were playing charades. Light felt more suffocating than the dark. It pierced my eyes, sending me to my knees, cutting our game short. I was sitting with arms wrapped around my boyfriend when sudden thundering voices had sounded and the laughter inside my head had started to falter. They're in here. Before I knew what was happening, our tiny piece of heaven was being destroyed. Figures appeared with heavy weapons, pale light flashing in our eyes. In the startling allure, my body became free for a moment. I caught Addie blinking rapidly, Harvey frowning down at his red slicked hands. The walls around us were painted, stained, and inhuman remains. And so were we. A woman came over to me, her eyes were wide and scared. Zack wasn't there anymore, a pile of bones on the floor. Astrid? She spoke calmly, calling for medics. All around me, my friends were being checked over. Harvey stumbled away from the figures, his eyes wide in the bright allure. No, he choked out in a laugh. No, we're fine, can you please get out of our house? He gestured to the door that had been blown through. Now that is going to be our day job tomorrow. Laughter sounded in my head, so I ignored the woman throwing a blanket over me, the words spewing from my lips before I could stop them. You mean it's going to be your day job? Astrid, the woman slapped me in some lost color bled back to reality. Astrid, can you hear me? I'm so sorry, sweetie, but you're in shock, okay? I'm going to help you, I promise. Her words collapsed into white noise when Addie started screaming, and Harvey was dragged away from her. I reached out from my boyfriend's hand, but he was kneeling on the floor. A man was shining a light in his flickering eyes. Nicholas, he spoke softly, and my boyfriend only cocked his head frowning. Nick, can you tell me how many fingers I'm holding up, please? His gaze found mine. It's okay, I told him, panic twisting my gut. It's okay, baby, tell him and maybe they'll go away. He did, through a spluttered laugh. 
Five. Now, can you go away now, please? Jeez, it's a Friday night, man. The man checking him over let out a hiss before lifting his head. Get away from them, he snapped, and the other figures backed away slowly. He looked scared and shaken. Can we get somebody else in here? He started picking dead bugs off of my boyfriend's neck with tweezers. We, uh, I don't think we're qualified to deal with this. And that was when my world started to come apart. My boyfriend was dragged away into hysterical Harvey attacked the woman trying to help him. I heard her scream, but before I could see what was happening, a cruel, cold prick slid into the back of my neck. I didn't realize that I was screaming too until I was being gently brought to my knees, trembling and sobbing into the ground. I was sinking into the abyss when footsteps sounded. A figure was looming over me and my lips were numb. Help. I needed help. I needed my friends. What have we got? A male voice crept into my mind when I was falling. Uh, six kidnapped students that went missing back in 2020. A female voice said, Four are heavily inebriated. One turned herself in. And Zach Cartwright is confirmed deceased. No traces of drugs or alcohol. There's nothing but bugs. I've never seen anything like it. These things are part organic, but... Astrid? I didn't respond, my eyes flickering. I felt my body swaying back and forth. No, Rachel. I jerked my head in time to the voice, reality bleeding back into fruition. Time had skipped forward, and I was sitting in a white room, my legs swinging off of a bed. My hair was gone, and a smiling woman was in front of me. She detailed the basics. I was quarantined inside a facility for victims of brainwashing. When I jumped off the bed and tried to get out, the nurse calmly led me back onto the bed. When she was less gentle strapping me down, the nurse told me that I was going to be in a lot of pain, but it was for the best. She said there was pain, but I don't remember it. Even if my body does, I still have scorch marks in the backs of my eyes. I was weak, my body limp, barf dripping down my chin when the nurse gently took my hands. Astrid, she ignored my correction. Would you like to see what has influenced this type of behavior? The nurse cleared her throat. We don't exactly know what it is. What we do know is that it attached itself to your spinal cord, feeding you information. Her lips formed a frown. Which has influenced you into thinking certain things. Um, your name, for example. She held out a small a silver instrument, and attached to it was a writhing thing struggling to keep hold. Astrid, you were a prisoner for three years and this is the result of your current mental state. We're going to help you, but you have to let us. Her gaze dropped to the ground, which would require a certain surgery to remove this infestation. No, I shook my head. I want to see my friends. Astrid, that won't be possible right now. Instead of speaking, I clawed at her face and screamed, demanded to be reunited with my friends. It hurt being away from them. When I tried to explain it, I received a sympathetic smiles. But then I had the surgery and the invisible ribbon binding us together was cruelly severed. I started therapy on my own and then with them. The others didn't talk. When Addie spoke, she would suffer seizures. Harvey preferred using a whiteboard. And Nicholas didn't even acknowledge us until he grew violent. And Dr. Chase thinks the things have laid eggs inside his mind and are still in control. Three nights ago, I awoke inside the bunker that had held me captive. With me were Harvey, Addie, and Nicholas. Zach was there too. In front of us was a picnic blanket filled with food and drink and we laughed and talked like we were still inside our own little heaven. Nicholas wrapped his arms around me and I nestled my head in his lap. He was smiling again. The walls around us were chittering and moving, calling. They want the show to continue. I thought that it was a dream, but my feet were caked in dirt from walking around barefoot. At breakfast the morning after, Harvey grabbed my hand and pulled me into the bathroom. He scribbled something on his whiteboard. Did you last night? What was that? I could only nod, breathless. He wrote another message, this time in bubble letters. 
lights out, we go looking for the lady that did this to us. He had drawn an angry face next to it and I smiled. I hadn't smiled in a while. Tella, our kidnapper, is inside the facility with us. She too is receiving a different kind of treatment. So, per what Harvey said, we plan to meet after lights out. But he never showed up. This morning, a nurse informed me there was an incident during his surgery and that I won't be able to see him anymore. Dr. Chase said that Harvey's in a very bad state. Nicholas and Addie are deteriorating, but I can still see them. When I go to sleep, I awake inside our apartment and the laughter is back. The chittering in my skull grows louder. Our little piece of heaven. But then I wake up and he's not at breakfast. Addie is missing too and the screams inside Nicholas's room terrify me. Please, can someone get us out of here? I just want to see my friends. 19 hours, 34 minutes, 308 seconds. Gifting is a no-brainer this holiday season thanks to the unmatched comfort and style of MeUndies. From undies and bralettes to socks and loungewear, MeUndies has the perfect gift for yourself or anybody else on your list, even those hard-to-gift people. MeUndies has a holiday gift guide that makes it all super easy. I've had MeUndies for a while and they are still the most comfortable undies that I've ever worn. The fabric used is as soft as a warm hug from your favorite sweater. It's breathable, stretchy, and oh so comfy, making it ideal for all-day wear. To stay festive during the Christmas season, MeUndies has new designs, such as Let's Chill and Snowflakes, along with many more. I have a pair of the Christmas light undies, and I've definitely received a compliment or two from Mrs. Creeps. Knock out your holiday shopping today and get 20% off your first order plus free shipping at MeUndies.com slash Mr. Creeps. That's MeUndies.com slash Mr. Creeps per 20% off plus free shipping. MeUndies, comfort from the outside in.